Well, good Good morning, everybody. Great to see you this morning as we come here. Today is Palm Sunday. Hopefully everybody has a palm branch. Everybody, have a, everyone hold up your palms. You got it? All right. We're going to shake our palms in just a minute, all right? Um, here's the other thing. In just a second, I'm going to ask not only our kids, but any adults the, um, that would like to be a part of the palm procession, you are all invited to be a part of that, and there is no age limit on it. It just means you have to be able to walk down the aisle and around the church a couple of times. And, and most of you are able to do that. <laughs> so, so don't just think this is just the kid thing, although the, the, certainly the kids are going to enjoy doing it. And, and also, all you adults, like I said, the choir's going to be here. It'll all be started off as, um, as Lexi comes down to light the Christ candle. She'll be leading the procession. And then she'll pause as the first line makes it through. And, and they're going to walk down the side aisles and come back up the middle. We have two hymns that will be doing that too. If you get tired, then just go take your seat and take your palm with you. It's all good. But this is a palm procession. I want everybody to do it. If you are in a scooter, you just scoot around with, with your palm. <laughs> just, don't mow, just don't mow anybody down. It's, it's, gonna, it's a great day for us, and it's a celebration for us and, and the triumphal entry. And it's, you know, Each and every one of us gets to take a part of that. This is the beginning of Holy Week. And uh, our next uh, service after today will, I mean, after today's services, we have, uh, we also have Monday, Thursday at 7 p.m. And then we have Good Friday on, um, on guess what, Friday. And it's on 7 p.m. as well. And, um, and let me r remind you, so on Monday, Thursday, there is, it's basically reenacting the upper room, of upper room events. And then Good Friday is reenacting the, the, the passion again of Christ. And it's a tenebrae service, which means on Friday, we start with the lights lit and all the candles lit, and then we slowly extinguish it down till the last reading and the last prayer and the Christ candle gets extinguished at that point. And then we leave in darkness and in silence until we come back on Easter Sunday. It's a very moving service. And Thursday is as well. You'll have the opportunity of having a foot washing. We'll have two stations. Pastor Meg and I will be up here uh, if you would like to do that. If you are not so sure about the foot washing, we also will do hand washing as well. Um, it's a wonderful symbol of what took place on that, on that upper room when Jesus gathered with his disciples and he reminded them in the great and his really it was it was his mandate to go and do likewise to the world so it is our way of doing that anyway so we'll have that going on and then of course on easter sunday we'll have the sunrise services we have two sunrise services going on at the same time we'll have one over at right in front of the chapel that one will be in spanish and uh and then we have one that will be over here in the east parking lot and um and that one will be have uh caleb our um assistant song director and youth director um he will be leading that and the youth will be a part of that as well and uh, so you can come and be a part of that and then we have our nine o'clock service like this and then we'll have um of course our eleven fifteen service as well uh, speaking of youth they have a, an outing this afternoon they have a wildfire youth group is going to the foot golf place and if you'd like more information about that you can see caleb or you can see where oh there we are kimberly up here there we go. Ring that bell. And uh, you can see Kimberly about that, and she can fill you in on that as well. Um, don't forget that this week we have our TNT meeting for that. And then next Sunday is the Easter egg hunt between the 9 o'clock and the 11.15 service. We'll probably about 10.40 is when we'll, we'll turn them loose on the eggs. And most of it will be over there where the Gaga pit is. We're going to put the little, little ones inside the Gaga pit. Uh, was, they can be contained, and then the others will be on a free-for-all for the rest of the half acre that's over there. Um, and then, of course, our Soul Sisters, which is a new uh, study group that's going to be starting as well. I think, my friends, that is everything. Oh, no, I do need to say. Um, I, um, many of you have already commented on this because you saw it on my weekend update, but we had to cancel Bible Alive Aloud. Um, we, there, was just, there were more than half of the spaces still open 
uh, as of last week, and there was no way for us to be able to cover all of that and still be ready for next uh, next Sunday. So we're, we're regrouping. I've already gotten some great ideas emailed in, um, some things we might want to look at to be able to do that a little differently, um, but be able to pull that off next year um, in, in a different way. But we're, we're, we're still committed to being able to do that. It's just we're going to look at it and see what, how we might be able to do that differently. So um, we look at that. I also want to say thank you to all of those who helped with uh, Breakfast with the Bunny uh, yesterday. Uh, we hopped right to it and got it all done. I know, I know, I'm so bad. And uh, but uh, but it went very smoothly. The kids that they had a great time, and uh, and it was just a wonderful time for people to come together. And the the breakfast was delicious. So the, the the activities were great. Anyway, uh, th those who were that were here had a wonderful time. So I want to thank you all those who made that happen as well. And I think that's everything I needed to say. We're going to do our Easter invite, and then we're going to do a Palm Sunday video, and then our bells are going to take us forward from there. So, my friends, open your ears and hear this Easter invite. Uh, don't spill that. My wife will be upset. I'm not. I'm a pro. You're a pro egg dyer. You know there's more to Easter than just the eggs, right? Yeah, chocolate bunnies, marshmallow chicks, and um, jelly beans. Hey, why don't you go to church with me this Easter? Can he come? Sure. But you know, Easter's not about the bunny, right? Wife's gonna hate this. Two thousand years ago, the world saw the original Palm Sunday. On that Palm Sunday, the Lord of heaven and earth entered Jerusalem on a baby donkey. He didn't come to us with power and magnificence, but with meekness and gentleness. On that Palm Sunday, those who sang Hosanna would five days later shout, Crucify him. On that Palm Sunday, Jesus turned his face toward Jerusalem, where he would endure the most painful and humiliating kind of death, the kind of death that would save the world. Palm Sunday is a reminder of who Jesus is and who we should be as we follow him. Palm Sunday reminds us that the way of Jesus is the way of the donkey, the way of humility, the way of gentleness. Palm Sunday reminds us that it's totally possible to be with Jesus on Sunday, but forsake him on Friday. And Palm Sunday reminds us that Friday is coming.
Dear friends, if you'd please stand for our call to worship. And those who want to make it through the Palm procession, you can go ahead and make your way to the back as well. We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks. We will journey through praise with joy in our hearts. We will travel through betrayal and death, cradling hope deep in our hearts. Jesus leads us through this week, and we will follow. For he is the life we long for. He is the word who sustains us. Setting aside all power, glory, and might, he comes modeling humility and obedience for all of us. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he one who brings us the kingdom of God. Let us pray. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, when you entered Jerusalem, great crowds waved palm branches and cried, Hosanna. Save us from our, our sins and make us to rejoice in you, our only Redeemer. Through your mercy, O oh God, we are blessed now and forever. Amen. Hosanna, loud hosannas.
Okay, better. All right. If I could get you guys to have a seat. All right, we're gonna hold our branches just a minute. But what I want you to do right now is what we've been talking about Palm Sunday. But what I wanna do is I want you guys to close your eyes. We're gonna travel back in time to when Jesus was entering Jerusalem. So close your eyes for me and listen to the story. So close your eyes, close your eyes. All right, here we go. All right, so we're traveling back in time and it's the day that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. Now you're outside, close your eyes. You're outside with your family and all of a sudden you see some men come and take a donkey. And they tell you, don't worry, it's for the Lord and he will be coming back, the donkey. And so you're like, okay. So you and your family are going to make your way to the entrance of the town. Okay, can you feel it? You're walking to the entrance of the town. And then you see a crowd. And you're like, oh my goodness. There's this crowd. And you hear them shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And you're thinking, Jesus is coming, and you feel this excitement, and it's bubbling down, all bubbling up from your toes. Do you feel the excitement inside? Can you hear it? Hosanna, Hosanna. And you hear the rustling of the palms. Do you hear the rustling of the palms? Yeah. So, but you still hear it the whole time, Hosanna, Hosanna, and the rustling of palms. But you can't see anything because... We're a little shorter than the others. So you're jumping with your excitement, trying to see over the crowd because you want to see Jesus come into town. So you're jumping with excitement. And then you see the top of his head because he's riding on this donkey. And you hear the rustling of palms and everybody's putting their palm branches down for Jesus to walk on. Or their robes even. They took their robes off for Jesus to walk on. But you still can't see, but you hear the Hosanna. But you know what you're going to do next? You wiggle in through the crowd, because remember, we're small. So we can wiggle in through the crowd, and we can get right up front. And then you see Jesus on the donkey, and your heart's beating. You can feel your heart beating, because you're so excited that you got to see Jesus come into Jerusalem. And that is what we talk about with Palm Sunday. We're waving our palm branches to remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And just like they laid their palm branches for Jesus to walk over, we're going to lay our palm branches up there at the foot of the cross to remember that we lay palm branches down for Jesus. So I want all of you, we're going to take our palm branches, yeah, all of our palm branches, and we're going to go lay them up at the foot of the cross. You want to have mine? There you go. Well, you know what? Miss Penelope has a couple. Maybe she can share one. All right, the cross is this way. Right? Everett, this way. Right up here. There you go. Sammy, your mom has one right there. And just go lay them at the foot of the cross, at the base of the cross. There you go just like they were to lay the palm branches down for Jesus. That's right. All right, now let's go sit back over here, and we're going to say a quick prayer. Okay. (laughs) All right, can you guys bow your heads with me? Father God, thank you so much for sending your son to us. Thank you for the the joy of the children, and for this song that we get to sing every Palm Sunday, Hosanna, and wave the palm branches in remembering that your son came to Jerusalem at the start of Holy Week. Father, I ask that you just bless us this week and that you watch over us and just keep us all safe. In your holy name that we pray, amen. All right. Would you stand as you are able as we affirm our faith 
with a recitation of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one Catholic, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. join with me as we go to God in prayer. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh God, how we love a parade. We eagerly line the streets and fill the sanctuaries to witness the triumphant entrance of Jesus into the city and into our lives. We get caught up in the excitement of the crowd and of this season. We anticipate the victory over the forces of death that we know to be a part of the Easter season of new life and new beginnings. But when the crowds have all gone home, we shrink back into our comfortable lives, seeking to avoid the difficult, violent journey we know lies ahead. 
We push aside Maundy Thursdays and Good Fridays of our lives because it is uncomfortable to face betrayal and violence and suffering and death. We confess, O oh God, we often more easily move from the exuberance of Palm Sunday to the triumph of Easter. But apart from the crowd, we are forced to come face to face with our own questions, our own confusions, our own doubts, and if we're honest, our own fears. And so in the, in the quiet of this time together, O oh God, we seek your presence in a special way. We seek the courage to walk with Jesus all the way to the cross. We seek your guidance and strength in facing the trials of our own lives and of those we love. Be with those whose energies are sapped by sorrow and grief and loss, and whose bodies are bent with grief. Be with those who are scorned by their neighbors or who are cast aside as being inferior or of no more use. Be with those who suffer in mind, spirit, and body, and give them a sense of hope and renewed purposes. We seek to follow Christ and not betray him. Help us empty ourselves of all our false intentions and to open ourselves to your will as Christ did. Strengthen us for all the betrayals and crucifixions we face that our faith and love may bring us victory over all the world, all that the world would bring us down. Teach us by Christ's example that when darkness, difficulty, and violence come over us, we can gather our best friends around us and share our love without restraint. In sharing with others, we can in turn be healed and made whole. Open to us the depths of your love hidden in the mystery of this week. Let us feel your presence and forgiveness even when we betray, deny, and run away. Walk with us, sustaining God, and lead us from denial and betrayal to affirmation, from death to life. In the saving name of Jesus, as we grow bold, as the redeemed and rede re reconciled children of God to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture passages come from the Gospels today, so as you're able, would you stand as we read the, the Gospels? Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And then from the other gospel, Matthew. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, which of these do you want me to release to you? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas. Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated.
Well, friends, today we really draw close the uh, series on violence, the Bible. Although next week we're actually looking at the, the solution to all the violence that we have seen. And as we've looked so far, we've looked at some of those passages that really do make us cringe. And, and for some people, it even makes them question the very character of God. And so throughout this series, we've looked at God's character. We've looked at the punishments. We've looked at the sacrifices, um, uh, at war. We've even, last week, we even delved into the violence, the difference in the violence between both the Quran and, and, um, and Christianity. A and, and between... Uh, each of these, we see that there's so many misreadings and misinterpretations and misunderstandings, all because of, well, basically misinformation that floats around there and people just accept it as fact. It's horrible, but it's true. And, and so uh, today we're going to look at, at not just at what happens when you have the palms waving, but as you hear, it quickly devolves into the crowd shouting something quite different. Instead of Hosanna, they begin to shout, crucify him. And really, it's some of the most gruesome, pain-ridden acts of evil that humanity has ever dished out. And some say that this is the bloodiest section of the New Testament. And through all the violence, it's all focused on one person now. And that person is Jesus. Jesus, whose entire life was spent in building a bridge between God and us and humanity. And the truth is, sometimes we get so caught up in the triumphant feeling of Palm Sunday's parade that we nearly bypass actual crucifixion and our rush to Easter celebration. But the lack of scars should clue us in that we haven't quite reached Easter celebration. To truly to celebrate Easter's triumph, you first have to go through the, the scar-laden torture and the death of Jesus. Here's what Matthew's Gospel says. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised if you've ever seen any of your loved ones suffer, if you've ever seen them sick or injured or just seen them in pain, it, it will get to you. It really will. But this is, this is even worse because Jesus wasn't suffering on his own because of something, some injury or something else. This, he was suffering for us, for each and every one of us. And to add to it is the whole, the other part, the same people, many of the same people who had been shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, are now shouting the words, crucify him, crucify him, wanting to see him suffer. And nothing about this is going to be quick or painless. Again, Jesus said, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. How much time do we really spend thinking about all that Jesus went through, his being denied, his being mocked, his being flogged, his being crucified? I mean, through the series, we've looked at violence in the Bible. We've looked at, at violence as a result of punishment and war and even the bloodiness of sacrifice. But here's someone who is truly innocent, innocent of all, and yet was willing to become the ultimate sacrifice for all of humanity, even those who were screaming for his death even those who betrayed him. So let's drop into the middle of the trial where the chief priests and the elders and the, and the scribes are, are now uh, having Jesus on trial, just as he said he would. He's before Roman governor Pilate, and, and, and they're shouting, crucify him. And, and Pilate's having a difficult time because Pilate really thinks he's innocent. And he had been warned by his wife, don't be a part of this. He can't see anything that Jesus should be punished for, much less for death, and much less death on a cross. But back to Matthew. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather the riot was beginning, 
He took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released from them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Here, Pilate is making famous a saying that continues even unto today. I'm washing my hands of this. But he's doing more than that. Pilate's actually enacting uh, uh, something that comes straight from Deuteronomy 21, from the law of Moses. He's saying, you guys want to kill Jesus. I find him innocent. I'm washing my hands. His blood is not on me. And what do they say? They shout back. They understand what he's saying. They shout back, then his blood is on us and on our children. This, this crowd, this violent crowd, wants Jesus dead. And they're not leaving without the sentence of death. And the Jewish leaders, of all people, they knew more than anyone else that when blood is shed, when blood is shed, then somebody has to be held guilty, especially by God. And here they're saying, they're saying, we want Jesus dead so bad that his blood is now on us and on our children. And Paul washes his hands. Barabbas, a known killer, a, a known ne'er-do-well, all-around bad guy, is set free. And the innocent Jesus is sent to be crucified. And at this point, we generally flip through the pages, we get to the crucifixion, and on to Easter. Yay! It's an empty tomb. But there's so much more that goes on even before you even get to the torturous cross. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Now, some of your translations will actually say, had him scourged regardless of the word built into that, is Jesus would have been stripped of his clothing. His hands would have been tied to a post uh, over his head so that his skin would be stretched out to its absolute, the most that could happen. Then, and then, at that point, they would have taken a cat of nine tails, which is uh, leather strips that had, as you heard, lead balls and, and such at the end of them. And also embedded in those was often glass and bone and other things else. Now, the ancient, there was an ancient law as well as in Deuteronomy that no one should get more than 40 lashes because 40 lashes was enough to kill somebody. But I don't think there was anyone there counting the lashes when Jesus was being whipped and scourged. And a Roman legion, uh, legionnaire would have stepped forward with his cat of nine tails, and it would have looked like this. This is what it's, it looked like. There was a short handle and a long handle, except the one that Jesus was being whipped with had, as you heard, lead points at the end. And each of those, those leather strips, those, they're called bongs, but those leather parts would have had, had parts that would have dug into the flesh. So the first hitting would have cut the skin. And then each lashing after that would have gone deeper and deeper into the flesh. And, and as the blows continued, you can only imagine the damage done. And because these are longer strips, when, when they would hit and then pull back, it would pull back bits of flesh. And, and the strings would wrap around, so it would also be the tender part of your side and, the, and the, your belly. And as it hits quickly began, it wasn't until he was near death that they finally stopped. You can imagine when they cut him loose, he would just collapse to the ground. And then the mocking begins. They take this as an opportunity to make a joke out of him. And they place that robe on his back, give him a stick for a scepter, 
And they place a crown of thorns on his head and they press it into his scalp. And the thorns would have pressed in and, and cut even more. And now he would have had blood flowing into his eyes and over his face. And they began to mock him, spit on him. And then they took the, the stick they'd give him as this fake scepter and hit him on the head with it. Can you imagine driving those thorns even deeper? And when they finally got tired of all this, they ripped the robe off his back. Now, remember the weather of this area. Fairly arid, dry. So all while they're torturing him, this, the blood is drying on this robe. And when they rip it off, some of us scream pretty good when we have a Band-Aid ripped off. This is like the world's largest Band-Aid and they just rip it off and they reopen all those wounds and continue to spit on him and mock him. So when you say Christ died for us, this is what he went through even before he got to the crucifixion, to the torture of the cross. And we're told he is so weakened by this that he can't even carry the cross beam on the way to his own crucifixion without stumbling. Again, in Matthew it says, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon of, by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. There's so much pain and suffering and malice and evil in that one little phrase, and then they had him crucified. It reads so easy and so quickly, but it would have hurt so much and taken time. When, when you start studying the idea of, of crucifixion, it's absolutely horrific, my friends. D.A. Carson, in, in his commentary on Matthew 27, says, 2,000 years of pious Christian tradition have largely domesticated the cross, making it hard for us to realize how it was viewed in Jesus' time. We're talking about something so gruesome, so ugly, so twisted and evil <laughs> that it's difficult for us to even imagine. When you look up uh, staros, which is the, the Greek word for cross or crucifixion in a theological dictionary, the first thing it says is staros is an instrument of torture for serious offenses. That's what should come to mind. It's a device of torture. Crucifixion wasn't meant to kill you fast. It was how much pain, how much suffering, how much humility could they inflict on a person before they actually died that's what the cross is and it was so horrible romans wouldn't even allow another roman citizen to be crucified the only way you could have a roman citizen crucified is if caesar himself said have him crucified that's the only way because romans thought it was beneath them to Jews, according to Deuteronomy 21, it means that you're cursed by God. So next time you hear that Jesus died, remind yourself, he didn't just die. He was crucified. He was tortured. He was inflicted with as much pain and shame as humanly possible in that day before his actual death. And we even talked about him being nailed to the cross. Now this fulfills prophecies about the Messiah. That we'd ha he would have his, his uh, feet and hands pierced for our transgressions. And I've previously 
gone into great detail and, and told y'all about what happens when someone is crucified. I'm not going to do that again this morning. Let's just say Roman masters, uh, Roman soldiers were masters of the craft and they could inflict the most pain so that you would stay alive longer and suffer more before your actual death. When they crucified you, they would try to drive the, the nail in such a way that it would actually abrate the nerve. They would actually be hitting the nerve. Can you imagine that kind of pain through your entire body? Left hand, right hand, both your feet. And then he's going to hang on the cross, suspended in the air. Only thing holding him up is his own flesh and bone. Remember, no bones were broken. So it's flesh and then the skeletal, the skeletal part of your body. And the only way you could breathe from that is actually push up on those nails in your legs and pull yourselves up by the nails in your hands. That's the only way you could breathe because your diaphragm was being compressed. And the way you could take breath is to push up against all of that and take a big breath for as long as you could, you could hold yourself up in that. And of course, what eventually happens is you become so exhausted and so much pain that you're no longer able to push up and pull yourself up. And so you slowly suffocate. Slowly suffocate. The evil that's being done to Jesus, and yet through all the pain, listen to uh, what happens next. This is from Luke. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to the place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on the right and one on the left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So all of this has been done to him, and yet he still prays forgiveness because he knows they don't understand. And then one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when we have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he says to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. Do you see the irony that's taking place here? I mean, Jesus' friends and his followers, they didn't stand up for Jesus. Jesus' disciples, with the exception of John, all fled, all ran away. They didn't stand up for Jesus. Pilate, who knew he was innocent, didn't stand up for Jesus. But this thief, this thief, he was like, I realize you're, you're innocent. I realize I'm about to meet God. We deserve our punishment. But Jesus didn't do anything wrong. And he pleads, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And this is what's amazing to me. Jesus on the cross, after all the torture and the abuse and the suffering, he forgives him. And here's something even more amazing is, Jesus wasn't just remembering that criminal. He's remembering us, you and me as well, as he's hanging on the cross. The tortured Jesus, they tortured Jesus. They didn't break him. Throughout the series, we've, we've talked about the accusations that people make against God. They ask questions like, is God just? Or is God loving? Is God merciful? And those accusations have made, been made 
towards God since, <laughs> since Adam and Eve. And after all the accusations, after all humanity has done to rebel against God, after all that we do to try to take God's place in this world, after all that and what we did to Jesus and all the violence, all the torture against Jesus. So when someone asks, is God loving and merciful? All we need to do is look to the cross. Look to the cross. And Jesus says, truly I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. So if you're here today, whether you're online watching us or, or here in the room, we need to remember that. In the midst of the violence, in the midst of our sin-sick world, we belong to Jesus. Christ died for us to give us hope and to give us a way home. And it all begins with you simply asking, Jesus, please remember me. I want to accept your death for my sin. I, I want to be one of those people who can say and believe it, that God showed his love for me. For while I was yet a sinner, Jesus died for me. That is what Palm Sunday into Passion Sunday means. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we need to confess that many of us have said, Jesus died for me, but we haven't really thought through what it actually means. Jesus suffered. He was tortured. He, he willingly signed up for the pain, the mockery, the shame. He did it because he was remembering each of us because he wanted us to be with him in paradise. Thank you, Father. Thank you for loving us that even though we are sinners who have fallen short of your glory, who have done thing ag things against you, you continue to love us. Holy God, we've talked so much about physical pain and and yet it wasn't just the physical pain Jesus went through. During this horrible ordeal, Jesus even cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because you, Heavenly Father, poured out your wrath for our sins upon your Son. We are thankful for this glimpse of what Jesus really went through. And I pray that we would love Jesus that we would really be able to see what he's done for us and that all our sin is now forgiven. It's been paid for and we are right with you all because Jesus was treated so wrongly. And now I pray for those who have not yet seen Jesus on that cross and said, that's my Lord, that's my Savior, that's my King. That's the one who's remembering me. I pray that each of those who hear this today would open their eyes and their ears and their hearts and would call out to Jesus to remember them and enter into a saving relationship. This I pray in the name of Jesus, who suffered and died for each of us. Amen. Jesus remembered us, and so we take up an offering every time we meet together so that we can spread that good news that Jesus died not just for us, but for the whole world. Would you pray with me? What can we offer you, Lord, that you have not already offered us? What can we do that, we have not already, that you have not already done for us? Lord Jesus Christ, in your gifts to us, you provided a way for us to live and to serve you. In both your triumph and your suffering, you deserve our praise.
Through the gifts we now offer, we express our longing to serve and to follow you wherever you go. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen.
things that I need to remind you of. One is we're doing our fifth Sunday loose change offering on the fourth Sunday um, for our humble Methodist women. They'll be in the back. They have buckets for you to put your loose change in. And if you forgot, loose change dollars work fine too. So... There's a lot of pennies in a dollar. Um, there also want to remind you, my friends, that there are tables set up underneath the screen just outside. That, that is part of the silent auction that went along with the, um, with the event yesterday. And so if you'd like to bid on any of those, there's some great things out there that I think you would enjoy uh, looking at. And, and if you want one of those, then put your name on it. We'll contact you if you happen to be the winner. That, that'll run through second service today, and then we will, we will let the winners know. So um, I, I, I lift that up for you you as well. And now, my friends, let us go forth with this blessing. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, send us forth as your people, people who have hope and who have peace for all future because of what Jesus did for us. It is in him we give thanks and joy today. Amen.